Welcome to the Silk Speaker Series at the University of San Francisco. My name is Charles Moses, and I'm the Dean of the School of Management. Thank you for joining us today from locations across the country and from all corners of the world. We hope that all of you and your families are healthy and safe. It is my honor to introduce today's Silk Speaker Series at the University of San Francisco. This speaker series is funded by a transformational gift to the university by investment expert, Jeff Silk, who's a USF trustee and alumnus and his, world, and his wife, Naomi. The series brings international thought leaders in business, finance, and global issues to, to students, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends of the university. Now in its fifth year, we're excited to, say, to share today's conversation with you. Our moderator today is Dr. Suparna Chakruberti, a USF professor of economics in our College of Arts and Sciences. She earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota with a specialization in international economics. She joined USF as an assistant professor in the Department of Economics. She was tenured and promoted in 2015 and became a full professor in May of 2020. Congratulations. She served as an associate dean for academic effectiveness in the College of Arts and Sciences from 2012 until 2020. As an empiricist, she works in, in, on international banks and mutual funds and their investment behavior, social and genetic factors affecting cross-border investment, as well as the role of gender and entrepreneurship in international investments. Currently, she's on the executive board of women in the Academy of International Business. She also serves as a member of the Western Association of Schools and Colleges Accreditation Panel. As a graduate student, she was a research assistant at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and a summer fellow at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Welcome, Professor Chuck Ruborti. Today's honored guest is Mayor C. Daly, President and Chief Executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. President Daly is a champion of higher education who recognizes its inherent role in social mobility and the long-term health of the U.S. economy. She has a compelling life story to share with us today. As a high school dropout who went on to earn a PhD, she's recognized as one of our nation's leading authorities on labor market dynamics. As a participant in the Federal Open Market Committee, she helps to set American monetary policy to promote a healthy and stable economy. Throughout her illustrious career, she has focused her in prolific research on economic inequality, wage trends, and labor force dynamics. She speaks with agency about the importance of mentors in her life. She promotes gender equity and has used her exceptional leadership skills to demonstrate that it can be achieved. Dr. Daly began her career with the San Francisco Fed in 1996 as an economist specializing in labor market dynamics and economic inequality. She went on to become the thanks the banks lead executive vice president and director of research. She currently serves on advisory boards for the Center for First Generation Student Success and the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at her alma mater, Syracuse University. As an extraordinary leader who inspires us to realize the fullness of, the, of our humanity through the power of education, Dr. Daly embodies USF's mission to change the world from here. She encourages and challenges universities, business leaders and community organizations to find ways to make higher education more accessible. President Daly earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, a master's degree from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and a PhD from Syracuse University. Born and raised in Baldwin, Missouri, Dr. Daly now lives in Oakland, California with her wife, Shelley. Welcome, President Daly. At the conclusion of the conversation, USF President Reverend Paul J. Fitzgerald of the Society of Jesus We'll offer some concluding remarks, so stay tuned. And with that, I join our audience in look, looking forward to today's lively conversation. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Charles, for that wonderful introduction. And it is my great honor and privilege to have this conversation with Dr. Mary Daly. Mary, welcome to the University of San Francisco, and thank you for joining us today. It is my distinct pleasure. I am very excited about our conversation. 
So without further ado, since we only have Mary for an hour, I'm going to quickly jump to the questions we want to dive into Mary's mind and get insights into what makes Mary who she is. Uh, Mary, you have a very inspiring career in economics. You started out as a double major in philosophy and economics. And I think we won you over to our, our side and you have decided to pursue economics and then you did a PhD in economics. So what got interested you interested in the subject? What made you choose economics? Well, I really love to study people and what makes people together, working together for con contributing. And I started out, and this is a sort of a funny story that I'll share with you. It, I started off thinking I might be a psychologist, but then I quickly learned that I'm better studying large groups than I am on helping people one-on-one -on -one because I was a little impatient in my younger years and I would sort of want to push people faster than they would want to go. And I learned that wasn't good for anybody. So I married a psychologist and I studied economics. But economics really is the psychology of people. Economics is about people. No matter how many people you might hear try to say it's about finance or money or numbers, it's really not. It's about people. The economy is only a collection of all of us. And if it doesn't work for all of us, then we really don't have a good economy at all. So that nexus of thinking about people, but bringing it to the aggregate to think about the society as a whole and the economy as a whole, that's what got me interested in it. And of course, I just love philosophy. So sometimes I'll go back in my head and think about models and things and that reminds me of my philosophy days. That was very inspiring because I think we always strive to make that connection that even though we are known as a subject that studies wealth, we really study people mm -hmm. for that. So um, I guess while we all have a general idea of what a Federal Reserve Bank does, and in fact, in our principals classes, the students get introduced to the workings of the monetary system and the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, can you really give us an inside look into the importance of a regional bank, right? Like the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, because we tend to think about the Fed as one big entity. Right. And in particular, how do you work with the other units uh, of the government, for example, the Treasury Department? Sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll talk about all of those things uh, in, that, in that question. So let's start by just saying there's 12 regional banks and then there's a board of governors. And we are one system. We're all here to do the same thing, which is to serve the American people on three core functions, three core missions. The first is monetary policy. And through moving our monetary policy, we create a sustainable and healthy economy and achieve our dual mandate goals of full employment and price stability. You probably learned that in your principal's courses. But we also have a, an active role to play in the payment system, making sure that the payment system, be it cash or electronic payments, is well-functioning, stable, dependable, and grows as the economy grows. So that it's not a restraint on growth, it's actually uh, helping in that, in that regard. And then our final core function is to think about financial systems. And we are one of many regulators that works on financial regulation and supervision, ensuring that this financial system, financial intermediation, if you will, is safe and sound and dependable. So those are our core functions and we do them all around the, the, uh, the country. But the people who founded the Fed in 1913, they were really focused on having geographic representation, recognizing that the central bank is really only as good as its knowledge about the people it serves directly. So we have these 12 regional banks, and one of my most important roles is to know the communities that I serve. Ultimately, I don't do my job well unless I am representing the communities that I am responsible for, and that would be the nine Western states and all the different communities in that, be them rural communities, urban communities, communities of, of great wealth, communities of much less wealth. How are we thinking about each and every one of those individuals so that we deliver our best in public service, which is, is our goal? And we have something at the front end of our building. You'll have to come visit me in the building one day when we can come back. And right as you walk in the lobby, there's a gigantic sign that, that we put up right after I became the president. And it says, our work serves every American and countless global citizens. And it's like our pledge, right? And that's what a regional bank does. No matter where you go in the country, that's what the regional banks are doing. They're in their communities serving every American. Now you asked a very important question of how we we interact with other branches or agencies of government. So the Federal Reserve is an independent system. It's an independent central bank. And if you, when you 
really get down into the details of central banking, you'll learn that independent central banks are the historically most stable way to have a central bank. You don't want them being part of government completely because they didn't then have an independent view about how monetary policy and other policies should be conducted. I think of this as just another one of the examples of the checks and balances that our society is known for, our economy is known for. But that doesn't mean, independence doesn't mean separate and completely unaware of each other. In fact, there are many examples of Federal Reserve and Treasury partnerships on behalf of the American people. In the COVID fight, the fight against COVID and the economic fallout, you might recall that the, you probably heard that the Fed opened a bunch of facilities, they were called, the 13-3 facilities. And those are really partnerships between Treasury and the Board of Governors to open different out, um, access to credit provision. We at the Federal Reserve, and this is the really important thing, we have lending powers, not spending powers. Elected officials, Congress, the Treasury, the, the executive branch of government, those individuals have spending powers. And so we partner with the spending powers folks, the fiscal side of the house, and we have the lending side and we intermediate the spending decisions that they, your elected officials have, have made. So those are really active partnerships. I expect the same partnerships that we've had historically to be that much closer or even well uh, moving, well oiled when, uh, with the new Treasury Secretary Secretary uh, Yellen, Janet Yellen, who is, of course, one of my favorite people. But these are just historically really strong relationships that allow two independent functioning bodies to come together and work on behalf of the American people. Mary, that actually was very inspiring. And thank you for clarifying the role of the Fed. You did say one thing which I wanted to probe a little more on. You said that the Feds have the lending authority or the lending power and the government has the spending power. Mm -hmm. In that sense, would you say that the feds are in some ways uh, supervisors of the government in the sense <laughs> that if you don't lend, they don't get to spend? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say because really the the those, when I said lending powers, not spending powers, I mean in terms of intermediating through the financial system, the, I mean, think of us as we have another important role in that financial system that I didn't go into detail on, but let me say, we, we pull policy levers, monetary policy levers. We set regulations that allow banks to interact with each other. We supervise those banks. We are really responsible for thinking about the plumbing of the financial system. And by plumbing, I mean in the pipes, you know, how do, how do you get a loan? How do people get credit? How do people get, we work with other regulatory bodies to make sure this plumbing is, is well functioning. Why is that so important? Well, let me give you an example. We lower the interest rate and the Fed funds rate, and that will go to lower car loan rates, lower mortgage interest rates, lower rates for state and local governments to borrow money to, to, to support the funding of the localities. But if they can't get access to that because the borrowing system or the lending system is, is impeded, dislocated oftentimes people call it, then that's a plumbing clog. And we have to go in there and make sure that that is unclogged. And so when I say lending powers, I mean that Congress takes on a decision that we wanted to give money to people under the CARES Act, if you remember, it, right is the first response to COVID. And then the Federal Reserve is responsible, along with the Treasury, making this partnership to make sure that that is available. So we opened a corporate bond facility. We opened a muni facility. We opened a, a Main Street lending facility. And perhaps the most um, you know, well-known one and really impactful one was the Paycheck Protection Program Lending Facility, where we had all these loans available, forgivable loans for the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses, but how do they get access to them? The Federal Reserve had to have some role in opening a facility to ensure that that intermediation took, a, took a place. So that is really the, the plumbing part of the job and it's not a supervisory part of the job. So let me tell you who the supervisors of the government spending are, each of you as voters. That's the accountability that Congress and the, the executive branch, the president has is to the public, to the voters who say, no, that's not how we wanna spend our money or that is how we wanna spend our money. One of the things that is coming through your conversation, Mary, is really the human side of economics. And you also mentioned that when you became the president, you put the motto, if you will, of the Fed as serving first the global citizen and the local citizen. 
So uh, given that even your academic, this is not new to you because even your academic work, I mean, you're, you have worked a lot on labor markets and you have done very important research on the disability benefits and the labor wages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the academic part of you. So what, and now you are, of course, one of the most important uh, policymakers in definitely the West Coast. So where do you see the confluence between the academic research and policymaking? And, you know, we are sitting in academia and typically it's considered an ivy tower academic research, which has no connect with the population, with the ground realities. Um, do you see that as true or do you see a gradual con convergence between academic research and the policymaking uh, apparatus? Well, I do think that increasingly, especially as I see younger people join our profession and it becomes a more inclusive profession. And I will say in economics, we have a long way to go before we have an inclusive profession, but we're making steps. And as you see that occur, what you see is a much more rigorous focus on the people part of it, but we're not there yet. So it is, uh, I think we have a lot, we're gonna gain a lot because Janet Yellen also famously said economics is about people. So it's now we got me and Janet and you. So we're the three of us uh, saying economics is about people, but in all seriousness, I think this is a growing uh, push to recognize why do we do it? Now from my own vantage point, the only reason I went into economics was to serve others. So for me, I'm a service oriented person and I want to contribute. And so economics was the toolkit I wanted to use to make that contribution. I think that's how so many young people I talk to really think about economics. It's not just an ivory tower exercise. It's the exercise that you see the benefits of or the cost of not doing it well when you walk along the streets of your community and you see people who don't have jobs or they're homeless or children who don't get the right schooling because they don't have the schools in good repair. Those are all illnesses of, of an economy that economists are dedicating themselves more and more to trying to fix. And whether you're doing it locally, nationally or globally, they're all these, I'd say, really important vocational interests. Ultimately, that's our North Star as economists, it should be that we come back to what are we doing it for and ultimately we're doing it for people. I guess your way of thinking about economics um, has not only been important but somewhat crucial because uh, one can definitely say that you're taking over the position of the Federal Reserve Bank president. Um, you have had an initiation by fire almost given the conditions for the last uh, few, you know, almost a year. So. What was your biggest challenge that you have had to tackle uh, once you took over as the president of the San Francisco Fed? So there were several challenges that, that have all have a unique feel. So let me just tell you two of them that I really took to heart. The first challenge is I have over 1800 employees working at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and they are the most earnest, dedicated, responsible people I know. I mean, just, you know, each and every one of them. And they too have to move home and start working from home immediately, still work for the American people night and day because we were doing a lot of work. You know, I just talked about the Paycheck Protection Lending Facility. Those individuals were 24 uh, seven, you know, the full time, no days off or anything. And they were experiencing all the concerns of COVID being having to homeschool their children, having to Zoom school, take care of elderly parents, make sure their, their neighbors who couldn't get out food and things that they needed. So my team, if you will, were dedicated to doing all this work. We have to pivot them very quickly and make sure that they're productive, but also hold the space for them to be humans in a pandemic we hadn't seen for a hundred years. And while it was challenging to make sure that got done, it was a top priority and it was, it kept me, you know, moving day in and day out. And so I feel really proud that we were continuing to do our work well for the American people, but that we also took care of our people and we continue to try to do that. And I think that's a balancing act that, that all firms tried to do and hopefully all firms continue to work on because that's, we really need to return this idea. Maybe that's what we'll learn from the pandemic. Life shouldn't be about trade-offs between work or family. It should be an integration of work and family and community. That's how we have the, the most productive people. And so it was a challenge, but it brought great benefits. Uh, I think of in terms of our learning. Another important challenge is that 
you know, you look at the unemployment statistics and you remind yourself that every day those aren't even fully capturing all the people who are out of work and that each one of those people is not just a statistic, it's a person who for no fault of his or her own lost a job is now trying to figure out how to pay rent, how to pay for food. You know, the lines at the food bank are long. I put these things right at my list. And those are challenges that were here with us before COVID and have been amplified, magnified through the lens of COVID. Or if they're essential workers and they were able to keep their job, but they're on the front lines and don't have the equal access to health care. One of my, uh, I did a, a Latinx uh, round table and one of my guests at this round table said, essential workers are considered essential when we need them and disposable when we don't. And I think that is a real, we should underline that, right? Put that down. That's the, that's the challenge that we face even coming out of COVID. How do we get out of COVID, leave no one behind and ensure we have a better society than one we entered COVID with? So a long answer to your question, but these are these are hard things to think about, hard things to experience, but we have to double down. We, we, can't, we can't stop working to ensure that we have you know, everyone with us as we move through this. Thank you, Mary. I mean, I guess uh, we should take a moment also to acknowledge your team and the staff at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and elsewhere, because even though we do not necessarily think of them as essential workers when we hear that term, but in some ways to revive the economy in our mind, we can definitely give them the status of essential workers. So thank you for continuing with the work in the strong times. Thank you for that. I know they'll appreciate that. They're here to serve you and whether they're on site in our buildings or home, uh, you know, in their closets zooming, uh, they're, uh, they're really, they're, they're dedicated to you, each and every one of them. And you raised some very important questions, a uh, human angle to this whole pandemic situation. There is an economic angle, there is a medical angle, but underlying everything, there is this human angle to the pandemic that you are seeing. And you have uh, also mentioned the point that the pandemic, you know, every lesson in history from the Spanish flu to whatever we have gone through in the past, the 2008 financial crisis have taught us something. So mm -hmm. the history lessons, so we imbibe the lessons and we move forward. So I guess my next question to you would be, what are the important lessons that the last challenging year has taught us? And uh, what do we have in our toolkit to look forward to in 2021, this year and the future? So can you share with us your insights? Sure, and you know, one of the thing about lessons is they often are not these epiphanies that we didn't know before, but they're a re-emphasis on how important things that we take for granted really are. So let me give you an example. You know, you, if you study economics or really anything, sociology, any in political science, you realize that we're all interconnected. But the pandemic has really showcased how interconnected we are. And the example I often give is, I wrote a, a, an op-ed about this for the San Francisco Chronicle, is that, you know, if I my, um, when we went out, you know, if my esthetician, you know, the person who takes care of my skin, if she can't work because she can't be on site, then I can't pay her. I can pay her, but she, you know, if you can't pay her, then she can't pay her rent. If she can't pay her rent, then the landlord who owns the building can't pay his mortgage in this case. And then the bank that holds that mortgage has less money to lend to other people. So that just, that simple example of interconnectedness is what all of us face. We're all interconnected with each other. And I think the big lesson that I would love us to come away with is that interconnection really is another way to say we all do better when we all do better. If we simply think of ourselves and we don't think of other people, that is a zero sum game that will end in a life that is less than it could be. The pie, the economic pie, the community pie of, ec of economics, it will all just be less than it could be. So what I want us to do is take that interconnectedness, recognize that people are not a drain on us, they lift us and we lift them. And if we think of ourselves as that entity where everybody does better and the community does better, the society does better, the economy does better, that will be something that we can bring from the pandemic. And it will be something that I think honors the, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives lost to the pandemic. I, I really do feel this 
that we're compelled to honor their loss of life by doing something more meaningful than just getting on with our own when this is done. And what I would like to see us do is take that interconnectivity and build on it, build on it to make a better future. I, I think that's within our reach. We just have to put our minds to it. That was such an uplifting answer, Mary. Thank you for that. So what I'm hearing from you is, yes, we had a lot of real time challenges during the pandemic, but uh, maybe the main vision is to take the pandemic as a uniting force in some ways. So every challenge might be a uniting force, which is bringing humanity together. And that is probably one of the most important lessons as we move forward. And uh, we should not forget the forces that unite us also have the capacity of breaking us. So we should probably choose the unity over the break that the system might uh, push us towards. Here, here, I like this. Maybe I will write this down and uh, I will credit you that the pandemic should be a uniting force. Very good. Thank you. That was, that was really uplifting. I'm sure our audience are, are also taking to heart the message from you. Now, Coming back to more of the practical realities of certain things, certain challenges that the Fed has had to do, you know, to uh, uplift the economy. One of the things that is always done is reduction of the interest rate, the Fed funds rate in your case, which has historically low levels. And we also saw that in the past, in the case of the Japanese, the last decade, uh, when there was also a reduction in their interest rate, so much so that the real interest rate was almost negative. And one of the real concerns there is it might lead to inflation because your target is to increase spending. And the flip side of that is probably a galloping inflation. So what would, is the Fed concerned about that? And what would be some steps that you might take to mitigate that if that is a worry at all? Now I'm going to pack a uh a lot of material into a short answer here, but I, uh, there's lots of ways you can go and learn more about what I'm about to say if it, if it interests you. So, you know, this, this, there, there is a concern um, that out there, and I, I don't say I share that concern, but you hear it and you see it in the newspapers, you can go on Twitter and you'll see this debate about, you know, are we, are we potentially spurring unwanted inflation? My answer to that is unequivocally, I don't think that's a risk we should think about right now. I don't, it's not that we shouldn't consider it ever, but it tends to be a theoretical risk more than a practical risk. And how do I offer that? Why do I think that's true? Well, let's look back at the last expansion. Last expansion, over 10 years, and we didn't even get inflation sustainably up to our 2% target, much less overheat the economy. We had a long, long period when the interest rate was low at zero or near zero. So these are, these are really questions that have been a part of our past. And I want us to be students of that history, really learn from it, but not be victims of that history and think that it's just gonna be around the corner again because it once was. So many things in the economy globally have changed. The pressures on inflation now are downward. And you mentioned Japan. Japan took those policies, but hasn't gotten inflation reliably back to its target in over three decades. And so you, you think about the pressures on inflation are downward, and that means we're going to be fighting inflation from below our target, trying to get it up to our target, rather than trying to pull it down. So many of your audience members probably are too young to remember the double digit inflation of the 70s and 80s, but I do, and barely, that's what I'll offer, barely, but I do remember it. And, but, but, but that was a very painful period that we went through to have to, the, it was called the Volcker disinflation. He was the chair of the Fed at the time and really had to raise interest rates, stop economic activity from going too fast and pull inflation back down to something that was closer to price stability to our target. But we haven't been in that situation for a very long time. And now our, our path is really about trying to get inflation up to 2%. So I am not thinking that we have unwanted inflation around the corner, but if we should get it, we are very, very good and practiced, have a long history of keeping inflation down to 2%, pulling it back. We won't let it get so far that it's double digit and then have to go through these you know, these enormous uh, changes. But I do think that we should be less fearful about inflation around the corner and recognize that that fear costs millions of jobs, millions of livelihoods, millions of hopes and dreams. Let's stay focused on the dual mandate, full employment, 
and price stability and not get too captivated by the fears about price stability that we forget about all those people who are sidelined and don't have the jobs they deserve. My, my job as a policymaker is to do both those things, full employment and price stability. And I'm committed to that. Mary, I'm going to push you a little bit on that because I'm going to don my um, householder hat right now. So I guess when I go to the grocery store and my greatest hope is that prices have not risen. So I my bill at the end of the month is reasonable. One of the things you also mentioned was that you do want to maintain inflation at a certain level, which tells to us that there is a need for this inflation to be at 2% or there is a need for inflation. Could you elaborate a little more on that so we get a sense of why is it important to have inflation when we generally have a negative connotation to the term inflation? Sure, that's a terrific question. And I, and I get rightly asked that a lot. Why, is, uh, why shouldn't inflation be zero? And for everybody out there listening as a student, that was one of the first questions I asked in my macro class. Why do I want prices to go up? You know, why shouldn't inflation be zero? And the answer is really, multifaceted, but I want to focus on some critical components. So we don't measure inflation perfectly. It won't be a surprise to you. I mean, we, we do our best as a, as a, you know, agencies of government go out and think about how much prices are, et cetera. So we don't, we don't, but we don't measure it perfectly. And so we need a little bit of a buffer. Uh, it's called Goldilocks, right? You need a little bit of a buffer. You don't want the, it to be too high. You don't want inflation to be too high, but you also don't want it to be too low below 2% because then you run out of your buffer. And if you, there is another thing on the other side of that, if it's zero, then you could also get deflation. So think about inflation. If you think prices are gonna go up too fast, you're out there buying today in the hopes that you don't have to pay a higher price tomorrow. And that's bad, you don't want, that's why price stability, this 2% is so important. But you also don't wanna be in an economy where you think prices are gonna be lower tomorrow. So if you're at zero in the economy and you don't measure it perfectly or the economy has a negative shock, you end up in deflation pretty quickly. And then people, households, businesses, everybody sits on the sidelines and says, well, prices for whatever will be lower tomorrow, so I'm not going to buy anything today. So imagine a whole economy of economic agents, all of us, who decided that we were only going to buy you know, what we needed and we weren't going to buy anything else because we thought the price would be cheaper tomorrow. The economy would simply stall out. And if that economy stalls out, that's thousands and millions of people out of work, et cetera. So we need this little buffer. And 2% is the number we chose because 2% is like the Goldilocks. It's just right. It's not too high and it's not too low. Because again, the risks to inflation being too high are well known, but I want I just articulate the risk to it being too low. And those are equally painful. And Japan is a really great example of that. They have been stuck in the mud economically for a long, long time, in part because they can't get inflation sustainably back up to its target. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so I guess one of the things that also worries us is that the pandemic has cost us a lot of jobs. And as you uh, mentioned in the conversation in the past, like the pandemic has been one of the critical factors for the unemployment that we are seeing. We were pretty much getting a handle on it and suddenly, you know, the unemployment has blown up. Um, however, what is interesting to people who look at the stock market is we seem to have a buoyant stock market and it seems to be going in opposite directions. We have these economic indicators, uh, unemployment, uh, the GDP growth, which is not doing very well. But on the other hand, we have this uh, stock market, which is booming. So is this irrational exuberance to some extent? How do you read how the stock market reacts in such situations? So I will not be reading the tea leaves of the stock market and answering if it's irrational exuberance or not uh, today, because really would I, I'm going to focus on something more um, more regular. It's just a regular part of the of, of economic activity. So I want to make two points for the audience. First is the stock market by its nature is a forward looking entity, right? These are investors looking ahead and saying when we're past COVID, what am I thinking the outcome of the economy is going to be? And so they're pretty optimistic right now in part because we've the Federal Reserve 
and the federal government, Congress, really went in boldly and put together a lot of support, a bridge, if you will. And I would caution us from calling this stimulus just yet, because you really, we're not in a point where we're stimulating the economy. We're in a point where we're bridging the economy over the virus. You know, as the virus goes, so goes the economy. We're trying to build a bridge that's long enough so that people don't get left behind and they're in their best position to start again, their economic activity fully when COVID is behind us. But because when, when investors are out there, whether they're investors at the household level or the market level, when they're out there and they say, oh, the Federal Reserve has acted quickly and boldly and Congress has acted quickly and boldly, then we're going to be in a good position to recover when COVID's behind us. And then they see the vaccine starting to roll out and things, they get optimistic. And so the stock market gets buoyed, gets pushed up. And so that's a that's just part of its forward lookingness. But the other thing that's important, and it's something that happens all the time, and it's, it's really useful to remember, is that when we lower interest rates, let's go back to the Federal Reserve, when we lower interest rates, several things happen. Uh, it spurs job creation, it spurs income growth, it spurs consumption growth. It gives all of these, these uh, things we measure a little boost, right? But it also spurs asset growth, value of your home, value of the stock market. When you think of all of those things going up simultaneously, well, what happens is the lower part in terms of inequality, the lower half of the, of the income distribution, the wage distribution, the job distribution, it gets benefited a lot when we keep interest rates lower so that people get a chance, they get a leg up, they get a hand on that ladder, whatever you wanna think about that works for you as a metaphor, they get a chance to participate in the economy. But while these things are happening, asset valuations are also going up. And it's just a fact in our society, in our economy, that assets are not distributed equally. That asset valuation is, he- I mean, assets themselves, ownership of assets is heavily tilted towards people at the upper part of the of the income distribution in the top half. And so what we see happen regularly is that inequality in jobs, wages, and income goes down in an expansion, but income of inequality of wealth goes up. So the remedy for that is to try and find real ways that people of all throughout our population can have access to assets. How can people participate in housing, the housing market? How can they participate in the stock market or other you know, safer assets that they might wanna participate in so that everybody has a chance to build wealth? But that's what happens and there's a, it's a trade-off I get asked about all the time is, isn't Fed's low interest rate policy supporting or producing inequality? And the answer is, Certainly, we are one of many factors. I mean, these are historical trends that have been going on for, for decades. So it's just we're one actor in a variety of things. And I could give a whole hour lecture on that if one day, if you would like. But, but, but seriously, we're one part of it. But even so, even in that part where the stock market goes up a little bit, but jobs and other things go up a lot, I am policy really is about helping everyone have a chance in the economy. And we can't pull the plug too quickly simply to let to deflate the stock market at the expense of all of those millions of people who might have access to jobs, wages, and income. So I guess what you're saying is, I mean, we do understand that on the asset side of things, with the policies that the Fed has had to enact, there may be a little bit uptick of inequality that we see, but probably the ills of that as of this point um, I shouldn't say they are less, but they're limited compared to the need for us to boost the economy, the employment. So I guess we just take it as a cost of moving forward. And and also for your, your listeners here, we have a very blunt instrument. You know, we have the interest rate and we have a dual mandate, full employment and price stability. And we're only one actor in the whole equation for the stock market. And so it really is not effective for us to use our blunt tool to try to solve a problem that's multifaceted, but we do know that our blunt tool, as blunt as it is, does directly support growth in the economy, growth in jobs, growth in wages, and growth in income for Americans. And it's what I said at the beginning, our motto, our mantra, our work serves every American. And that's our pledge. Do you feel like the Fed gets blamed uh, unfairly at times when we have situations like this? 
I, you know, I think if you're in public service, you owe it to everyone who you serve to just explain. So I don't ever feel blamed. I feel, I take it as people are inquisitive and they would like to know. And most of the questions I get are actually fairly polite. People are just and want to know that what want to know and so I find my discussions are very good so I don't focus too much on being blamed I just focus on being informative being transparent and being accountable you know living up to answering these questions to your point about this I wrote a speech on is the Fed contributing to inequality and I gave it last year in November because I think it's a valid question for people to ask you know and then have us sit up and answer for them and and go through the details so that people can can see, I want to show my work so that people can see and, and view for themselves, judge for themselves. Thank you, Mary. It's uh, clear from your conversations that you not only uh, believe in the fact that uh, the Fed is first and foremost accountable to the people, but you are living that mission of being accountable to the people. So we certainly, um, even if we blame you, we certainly appreciate <laughs> what you're saying. And uh, definitely that is very good to hear. Thank you. Now, one of the questions uh, that is uh, coming up always is that, you know, workers who are, are let go in a situation of crisis are also the last to be rehired. And here I'm kind of banking on both your uh, role as a policymaker and also more your academic research because you know the labor market like the back of your hand. I mean, this kind of accentuates the problem of inequality. And uh, recently you have been advocating for a sustained and a robust recovery. I mean, that's your vision. So can you share with us a uh, part of your vision and how can that help the ones who are, you know, let go the first and rehired the last or the last, you know, 5% of the population? You're, you're absolutely right. This is a common theme in, in labor economics that traces back, you know, generations essentially and so and you referenced that I, I really um, focus on a sustained recovery a sustained expansion and prior to COVID you know we were thinking we, we lowered the interest rate twice in 2019 in an effort to continue to sustain the expansion make sure it's robust despite the fact that unemployment was fairly low by historical measures at that point so why do this it's for the reason you just said a lot of times the workers who are the less advantaged in our society are the last to be able to reap the benefits of a strong economy. So maintaining its strength, ensuring that they have an opportunity to get a job, come in and then move themselves up in their jobs by having another job be available that contributes to the economic mobility, get wage growth, get income growth. Even see, you saw wealth accumulating for less advantaged groups in the last expansion because we had a duration of an expansion that allowed pe more people to participate. So that really is the, the I think the, the magic of this is a long and sustained durable expansion helps workers that people are individuals, people had written off, sidelined, thought that forevermore they would be out of the labor force, out of work, but they weren't and they came in. I, I did a paper, as you mentioned in my research, I did a paper in, um, it's published in the Brookings uh, papers and it's, you can, it's free and available for people, but it's on who benefits from a hot economy. And it really documented that the less advantaged workers in our society benefit from a hot economy. And it starts to chip away at these gaps that we see between blacks and whites, Latinx and other, and other workers, uh, less than high school or high school education and college educated. All those gaps start to narrow when people who are less advantaged get a chance. And that research was super compelling to me but not as compelling as what I heard when we did Fed Listens. So Fed Listens was this big year long listening tour we did as all the regional banks participated in the Board of Governors. And time after time, we would have academics, policymakers, community leaders, businesses come. And what we heard time and again is that workers who they didn't even get a second look, business leaders, business owners, CEOs were going and getting giving those workers a second look because they needed people. And so they were going out and saying, what do you, what can we do? And they would provide training and things. And to a person, these business leaders, these CEOs told me that these people who they had thought of written, they'd written off, never looked at, at a second time, they were the most loyal, productive workers they had on their teams. And so that's why we want a sustained expansion. And that's why we want an inclusive economy then those individuals can feed their families, take care of themselves, have economic mobility, pass the next generation, a better future than the one they had. 
that's the that's what we should be doing. That's the virtuous cycle of economics that we talk about. And that's the what I'm devoted to in terms of my policy. So I guess uh, one of the suggestions from the audience members might be who are hearing a conversation is uh, maybe the government, the federal government and the feds need to do more to build up the skill set of this bottom 1% of the population and probably give the corporate houses some sort of subsidy or some sort of you know, package, care package, if you will, to hire and train the 1% or the 5% who gets left behind. So I was just wondering, is there, do you hear in your corridors of power any move for such strategies or any, any conversation around this? So I'm going to offer something that I think is really important to take in. We're not talking about just one or five percent of our economy. We're talking about many, many, much larger fraction of this, of people who don't have the equal access to education, don't have equal access to occupation. So to, to you know, you might get the training, but then you don't get the job that's consistent with your training, or you can't get into every occupation, or even if you're in the same job, you don't get paid the same because you're a different gender, race, or ethnicity. So I did a paper just a couple of weeks ago. It was presented with three co-authors here at the San Francisco Fed, and we wanted to do the following, and, and this is what we found. We wanted to ask the question, what if the gaps in educational attainment, occupational distribution, uh, allocation where you, you get to work in a job that you're trained for, and wages, what if those gaps between men and women, blacks and whites, uh, Latinx and, and other workers, reduced? What if they were zero? How much more money would the U.S. economy have? How much higher would GDP growth be, GDP be rather? We estimated that we've lost $71 trillion in U.S. economic output over the last 30 years, and we're losing $2.6 trillion a year, and that number is only rising. So that's the real cost of these things. So it's not one or 5% of our economy. It's much, much bigger than that. And there is an absolute role to play in increasing access to educational attainment so that people have equal opportunities to get an education. But it goes beyond that. It's about paying for the right paying people the, the work they do for the work they do, rather than having some penalty because you're you're a female or, or an African-American worker or a Latinx worker, or you happen to be born in a geography that is the wrong zip code. I mean, these are these are terrible penalties we, we exact on people and they're hurting our economy. So it goes beyond fairness. It's it's fairness and it's economic output. The pie is bigger for all of us if we get these things fixed. So I think education is one of the keys I definitely um, have always been a believer in that. But if you think about how many young first generation college want to go to college people there are who are now not signing up because of COVID, that's a that's damage we can't allow to happen. So I know at USF you're really focused on this too, but that's something that we're we're incredibly focused on at the San Francisco Fed. And I guess our missions align in some ways because USF has always been about social justice and mm -hmm. social justice is the path to social justice is all of us growing together as a community. So it's definitely heartening to hear that there are conversations uh, amongst policymakers on how we can move forward in this path. Thank you, Mary, for that. Now, one of the things that was a little bit surprising to me uh, was the fact that, you know, when we think about the Fed, we have never kind of, or at least I have never associated Fed with climate movement. Mm. But it's very interesting that Fed is now engaging more in a sustainable environment or a climate movement. And I guess that is surprising. It's a new direction for the Fed in some of our minds. So can you share your thinking on why this push or what, what gave rise to the need for the Fed to kind of feel this is also one area where Fed needs to be cognizant of and perhaps play a role. Well, you know, it's, whenever I get asked this, I always think it's a little surprising that people are surprised. But then I realize, again, that people don't fully understand, like, what our role is and what we mean when we talk about climate. So let me let me kind of talk about that. So there really are two aspects of climate that are you can think about. One is climate change. Why is the climate changing? And what mediation strategies would you do to try to stop that from happening? And that's squarely on the, the plates of our fiscal 
side of the house, right? People, those are the individuals who are tasked with making the decisions about how do we mitigate climate change. What the Fed is about is understanding climate risk. It is a fact that the climate is changing. It is a fact that severe weather events are increasing. It's a fact that fires are more prevalent and prominent and more destructive here in the West. Hurricanes and storms where now half the country is in a winter storm. And then in the summer, they will be in a heat wave. And so these severe changes in temperature, these things we're not prepared for, whether they're hurricanes, floods, uh, fires or just severe changes in temperature. We have to study those things as a Federal Reserve because, again, we're responsible for the economy, uh, monetary policy sustaining the economy. We're responsible for the financial system with our other regulatory partners and parts of the payment system. And all of those are directly affected by the climate. So we have to understand what the risks are and think about how those risks can be mitigated. Do we have cash in the right place so that if there's a hurricane, we can get a payment vehicle to people when they need it? Do, or when a fire dislocates an entire group, do we have are we sure that the banks are ready to take on those loans? Have they been thinking about where the climate risks are so that we're, we've got no injury to the financial system because we were unprepared for the climate events that are surely going to happen? So I see it as if we weren't doing it, then I think people would have a valid and should come to us and say, you should be doing this. But we're out ahead of this because our responsibility is to look forward and ask not just what's happening today, but what are the risks forward and how are we preparing to ensure that we're in our best place to meet them. Again, our work is for every American and, and countless global citizens, but that's not just work for the economy we have today. That's work for the economy we're going to have five years from now, 10 years from now. Larry, thank you for that. And I guess uh, before our final question, I have time for to sneak in one last question. And we have spoken about a lot of about the economic um, work that the Fed is doing, the concerns that our economy is going through right now. So I just wanted to ask a question on a lighter note that what makes President Mary C. Daly who she is and what is the secret of your success? Well, you know, success is one of those things that I... I have to say, that's not what I thought about every day. I grew up in an environment where I saw people suffer. You know, they lose their jobs and then suddenly they've lost their homes and then they lose their health. And the stress level alone is enough to, to make people not want to you know, fight through it. And I saw this in a, in a pervasive way in my communities and, that I grew up in. And so I am other focused. I have a North Star. My North Star is help others. I want to leave the world having thought I gave it my all to make it a better place. And if that's a small piece or a big piece, then that's still my mission. And what's happened by just doing that and getting up every morning thinking about that, then the success that people tend to measure and count has come. But when I go to bed each night, what makes me happy, what I what soothes me and makes me gives me the most gratitude or grat is most gratifying for me is this idea that I'll get a note from somebody saying, what you're doing has made a difference to me, whether it's that I sent them a nice note, I said something in a town hall for my, my team, or I've given a lecture or a talk, and someone said, wow, something you said resonated with me, and I'm going to go act, do X or feel better because of that. That's the stuff that I put it in what I call my box of diamonds. My box of diamonds are things I collect that are said to me or done or I see that just I, when it's a dark day or don't feel so good, I just get them out and I remind myself why I'm doing this. And ultimately, I'm doing this for others. And that's what makes me tick. I get the most satisfaction out of, of helping others. And, and when others do better, I feel great. Mary, that just speaks to the people-focused leadership and the people-focused uh, uh, view that you have that not only pervades your work as the president of the San Francisco Fed, but uh, you as a person. And I'm going to steal the quote box of diamonds because that's something we don't look at too often, but that's probably something that makes us shine. And given the last few uh, minutes that we have with you, one of the questions, because I have a lot of students who have joined us for this conversation and they're looking forward to hearing what advice do you have for a student population in general and also uh, in the world where, especially in our profession, where we do not have that many women who are in the economics profession, especially for the young women in our university and the young men, 
What is your advice to the future students? These are the ones who will create and shape the destiny of the global destiny and the local destiny. So what would be your advice to our students? Okay, so nothing gives me, you must know this, or somebody must have told you, nothing gives me more pleasure than to talk to young people. And here's the reason to each and every one of you listening. You are our future. You literally are our future. And that is an inspiring thing to me to think of you because I think of young people today as having the fortitude, the ability to see outside of yourselves and, and take on these issues of social justice and economic justice and another focused society. So that's a terrific thing. You have all of those great attributes. And you're gonna find that not everybody invites you to the table all the time, but go anyway. You know, whatever you've heard people say, pull up a folding chair, whatever it is that you want to think about, what I want you to know is I'm inviting you to the table. I'm inviting you to be there because we need you. We will be a better profession, a better society, a better economy for your presence. And if you're not someone who you see a lot of people around who look like you when you walk into the room, that's okay because you've got the full weight of me, Janet Yellen, everybody who's gone before you, all your teachers, all your mentors, we're with you, even if we're not right there. And so what I really want to say to each and every one of you is you don't have to do it in one day, though, right? This is a lifetime. If you asked me when I was your age, would I be the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco president? I'd have to go back to my macro textbook and remind myself what the Federal Reserve did. You just, just take the opportunities that feel right at the moment. Don't get caught up on the perfect thing or plotting a perfect situation for yourself. Keep a North Star. Ask, what do you want to do in the world? And then keep doing that. And you sometimes do it in lots of small ways and it turns into a big way. But either way, you rest easy at night. So the main message for you is hold, be confident in yourself. Be bold. And you'll know I have your back, whether I'm right there with you or not, I'm always there for you. And take me up on it. President Daly, it was such a pleasure hearing you speak because I think what I am coming away with and all my students and my colleagues, I'm sure are coming away with, we needed to hear inspiring words. We needed to hear uh, someone talk about the North Star and we needed to be reminded to look into our box of diamonds. <laughs> so. Thank you so very much for joining us today. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to invite the president of the University of San Francisco, Father Paul Fitzgerald, to speak to us. He has been a champion of social justice causes. And he, just like you, is one person we look up to in times, um, black times. And he's the beacon of light that shines forever at USF. So Father Paul, welcome to the stage. And we would like to hear from you. Thank you very much, Suparna. And Dr. Daly, thank you for an inspiring, uh, engaging, educational, but also edifying uh, conversation, really edifying. In the best sense of that word, you build up community. Um, you know, I think your early love of philosophy has never left you uh, because I think that not only have you mastered the you know economics and kind of the larger mass psychology of, of, of human behavior, uh, but you continue to love wisdom in, and bring that love of wisdom into, into your leadership. Um, I, I love this sense that the economy is just the collection of all of human actions. Uh, economics is then, you know, really the study of people, and it's a discipline for the good of people. And then economic systems um, are judged by how well they serve uh, humanity. But you also... Uh, introduce something that's very near and dear to, to, to us at USF and to Jesuit education you know, all over the world, which is all things being equal, a preferential option for the least advantaged. You know, the system is working well for the majority, but you know, we don't embrace utilitarianism, you know, that, that, that a small group can suffer horribly if it benefits the great number, the great majority. But, but rather, you know, we're judged as like in ancient Israel, the king was judged uh, by how well the poorest person was faring in the kingdom. The queen was judged by how well the poorest person was faring. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, that it makes for better policy making, uh, that it makes for uh, you know, the betterment of the lives of those people who are welcomed in, 
but diversity, equity, and inclusion makes for a stronger economy, <laughs> brings more wealth uh, to everyone. But then, uh, there again, we still have to make sure that it's uh, distributed to everyone in equitable ways. Uh, poverty is uh, the illness in an economy which we should seek to heal and to mend. I love that. And the flip side, you said, you know, there are no disposable people. There are no disposable people. And that's something we always have to remind ourselves again and again when we make decisions and look at the intended consequences, but also the unintended consequences. Uh, because as you stressed again and again, there is an interconnectedness among human beings. Um, maybe a different way of saying that that we've experienced in the pandemic is there are no unbreachable borders. We can't close the gates and, and keep a virus out, nor should we close the gates and, and keep out human beings who, who need, you know, the wealth of our society and the wealth of our culture uh, in order to, to improve their lives. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this down and keep it for myself. Your leadership philosophy uh, to be informative, transparent, and accountable. I like that. Um, and I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, and, and maybe it's just an echo of Heidegger uh, that has, you know, we read once upon a time and it just has stayed with you. But a human being, you know, becomes herself to the extent that she gives herself away again and again in loving service to others. So I think you, you meet Heidegger's definition, you are a mensch. <laughs> so thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for informing us. And um, and, and helping lead us out of this rough patch where we are to a better a better tomorrow. Thank you.